Therefore, behold, I will again do marvelous things with these people, marvelous and astonishing things. And the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the understanding of their discerning men will vanish and be hidden. In these translations, each of them, as you look at them, as you hear from the, the God's word, you see how the people of Israel had gotten to a point where they did just come to service, come to the temple, come to the synagogue, and they just performed. It wasn't heartfelt. It wasn't felt within. Those who those went, went before them had created a set of expectations to fall, and they were not bad, necessarily, but they were not necessarily from God either. And if they were from God, they didn't understand why they did them. These traditions and rules were not sinful, but they, but they were meaningless and not understood by those who came behind them. Behind them, They did not go to their place of worship to encounter God, but to do the task their fathers had laid out for them to do. Understand them. Just really get an understanding here. That it was not, that it was wrong what they were doing necessarily. It was simply not from their hearts. They did not put much thought into it. Is something really that they ended up tagging on to the end of the week. Now I'm sure they were like 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 all of us. They put their hearts and their, their energies into their work week. They they gave their employer or their or whoever they however whatever they did for work, they gave everything they could to make sure they could provide for their families. They spent time with their families, they did their had fun, they, they gave their whole hearts to playing and doing whatever games they might play, you know. They don't play go play floor hockey or or basketball or things like that, but they, whatever games they had as, as, as in Israel, they, that's what they did. They, 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 they did all these things, but at the end of the week, when it was time to go to worship to the temple to worship the Lord God, they did it without any thought as to its meaning. When they went in and sat down into the place of worship, when they stood to sing, it was just words. When they heard the prayers, it was just words. When they heard the proclamation of God's word, it was just words. Now for Israel, this got them into a lot of trouble over and over and over again. If you look through their history, you can look even back to when God took them out of, out of Egypt and they got into the middle of the desert and they're in, going towards the promised land. What did they do? All they had learned, all they were told to do, Things so we see it over and over again. They would practice the, the, the practices of the people around them would seep into the worship of, to their, of their one true God. They would begin to accept that everyone around them was okay and the things that were going on around them it was okay for them to be close to them and to, to just in, in influence what they were doing. <coughs> but time after time, God would have to send his prophets to them to draw them back to the right path. Time after time, God would have to remind them that the only true God was him, and that all other gods were false, and the path, and the path well, there was only one path that led to him, and to him was through true worship of him, and no one else. Not Baal, not, not all these other things, not to put up ash, ashes or, or these these towers or these pillars of, of worship of, that were the other people around them were worshiping. The message would need to be proclaimed time after time that he was the only true God, even up to the point where God would have to send into the world his Messiah. And his Messiah would proclaim that I am the only way, the only truth, the only path to God. No one can come to the Father but through. Time after time, God had to come to his people and to proclaim to them that he was the only one, the only true God. But how, how does this relate to us? How does this, this relate to who we are, what we do? And does it relate to us at all? Well, you know, as we look at worship, as we look at what we do, after time after time, we, we come into this place and it does become tradition. It does become something we just do. We don't know why we do it. I found a little skit that was done by the, the, the 
video that's done by the skit guys. I want us to watch that right now and just give you a little bit of an idea of what I think of how this is working. Alright, how does it relate to us? Well, it does relate to us in lots of ways, lots of fashions. When I was a boy, you know, you think how we, we do things in our worship, we have a certain way of doing things, a certain way of, of handling things, and so forth, and uh, it hasn't changed. I remember when I led worship at Dover Court Baptist Church, we had a very much a routine. A bit, and we, did, we did things out of, uh, and you could go into any Southern Baptist Church across our denomination, and you'd come in and you'd, this is the routine. The, the leader would sing that up and said, take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 355. And everyone would, would, would stand and sing that, that hymn. And before, at the end of that hymn, he would, he, they, before they would sit down, they would know now we're going to open in prayer. So they'd open in prayer. And then they, they would all sit down. And then we knew the next thing was, now we were going to have announcements. And we'd leave with all the announcements. And then the, the, the song leader would stand and say, please stand again and let's, let's sing hymn number 385. And everybody would stand and begin to sing, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so, or whatever the song happened to be at the time. And then at the end of that, they would say, please remain standing for a response of reading. Please turn the back of your to, to number 588. And then they would turn to 588 and they would begin to say, I will read the dark and we will respond to the light. And the, the, they would go forth and they would do the response of reading. And then we would all sit down. We sing another hymn, and at the end, close that hymn, we say, now please the ushers come forward, and actually you can have to tell the ushers to come forward, because they just come forward to receive the offerings. At the end of the offerings, they, everybody would sing another hymn, and say, so turn to hymn number 185, we turn to 185, we sing just uh, some, just, some one, of the, one of the hymns, and uh, then someone would stand up, and they do it with special music, and special music be done, the pastor would say, no, it's his turn, he stands up, he preaches the gospel, and then he, at the end of that, that you pray, you know that he was going to pray, so it's as soon as he prayed, all those that are involved in worship, the worship leader and the, the, the pianist, the organist, would get up and, and get to their places. And he would say, now turn to, the, the, the song leader would say, now turn to uh, 182. And everybody would turn to 182 and stand because that was so what we did. And at, the end, at that time was the invitation. So people would know that they could come to the front, they could pray. And then at the close of that service, we'd pray. And then he'd say, just goodbye, everyone. And that, and that was service. And you could go to a church here in Edmonton, you go to church in Vancouver, you'd have the same thing. You go to church in Vancouver, you go to church in, in Oklahoma City, and it'd be the same thing. Why do we do it that way? I don't know. Why would you go to one church, like a, you go to one back, you go to the Baptist church, and everybody would sing, and they'd be afraid to, to clap their hands or to raise their hands, so you see a lot of people have in their hands in their pockets, or they'd be at the back of the, hold on to the back of the pew. Heaven forbid they might raise their hands or clap. Because the people that raised their hands and clapped, Caden, were the were the were those Pentecostal guys. Right? Now in our churches you might see someone clap and you might even see someone raise their hands. And you, you know they it, it was it, you don't know why we do it those that way. You don't know what, what it is, the purpose of it, or or why we do it that way, but that's how we do it. Down in the States, there are people that have snakes. Poisonous snakes. snakes. I think they're nuts. <laughs> Why do they do the things they do? They may not even know either. Why do we stand when we do? Why do we sing like we do? Why do we do all the different things we do? Now, not all those things are wrong. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. But we need to know why we do the things we do. Because as we don't, if we don't, Enter their enters in a problem. Because all these things, although they may not be wrong, we should ask ourselves, does it seem that our worship is, is more often influenced by the, the seekers around us or those who are seeking and think that, that, that how they think? Or is it influenced by our relationship with God? Is it what we don't want to ask because we, when we come to worship, it's mindless or heartless lip service to a God that we have not made an effort to get to know? Or is it that we have fallen into the dangers of the people of Israel who did? Their worship was with no heart, and it was empty. They followed what their fathers had done, and those who had gone before them, worshiping their traditions more than God. We must see that worship 
that is done out of habit becomes just pretend. The Israelites were just pretending to worship God out of duty, not out of a relationship with God, the God that would save them over and over again as they would fall away. Now maybe you're saying, Pastor Nolan, that just says, I don't see, that's just maybe just your point of view. We're not that bad, really. We're, we, we, just be, we, we just do things like that. We don't necessarily do things like that. Well, I know that I, as I've grown up in church, in certain, that we do things in a certain way. And when we think about change, the first question we ask is not, what did God have us do? The first question we ask is, or the first thing we say is, that's not how we do things. That's not how we've done it here in the past. Or we might even say that's not part of our culture, our church culture. We are con quick to condemn the one that might draw us back to what God intended. You think about what happens here in Israel, in Isaiah, and in many other places in Jeremiah, when God sends his prophet in the world, draws people back and draws them back into true worship, away from the false gods, away from the false things of the world. So they're quick, they're not, they're, they don't hear them. They're quick to condemn the message or not the message. How do we know when our worship is real or false? Well, one of the ways to do it is to see is the people are disconnected with God when we come to worship. Or they spend time more evaluating in the service with words like I or me. They talk about that service did not feed me. Or that service was boring to me. Or it was, it was fulfilling to me. Or I didn't feel... Or I, or me, and let's go on. They talk more about the people than they do about their encounter with God. Now sometimes that's the fault of the church and the leaders, but other times it's our own heart that's, the, that's at fault. We must look at our hearts first and see what's happening on the inside before we start to look at what's going on in this building. In James chapter 3, verse 7 and 2 through 10, the New Living Translation, we read this. It says, People came containing, rather, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. No one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of, of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, that is not right. When we come to worship God, what is coming forth out of our mouth? What is, what is on our, in our heart? We must come with the right heart. We must come with our minds set upon God. And how can we do this if the rest of our life we're so far away from God? To worship. To truly worship. It does not depend on the pastor of your church. It does not depend on the leaders of the music. It doesn't depend, what it does depend on is your relationship with God, where you are when you come into this place. If you want to come and encounter God in worship, if you want to come and experience what worship is about, examine what's going on in here. What's coming forth from your mouth. If we want heartfelt worship, if we want to have fresh worship, if we want to have worship that changes us, we must become before the Holy God and examine what's going on in here. It's then that this can become more of a practice, more of a tradition, more of just something that we do at the end of the week. More of what the world thinks worship is. You know, you go and I talk to many guys in the military and, have, and guys that I work with drive a bus. And when you talk to them about church, their image is this boring place that no one seems to be alive and they're just tired. And at the end of the week, they have no energy and they just they go hang out at church because that's what they do. That's what they've grown up doing, whether it's at the United Church, whether it's at a Baptist church or a Catholic church or an Anglican church, or a Pentecostal church. It becomes something that they just do, and it's they, they, just, they, they fall after, because that's what they've always done. So little about our relationship with Him. 
In Psalm 81, verse 1 through 16, the whole chapter of Psalm, we read this. It says, A strong, a song to our strong God, a shout to the God of Jacob, anthems from the choir, music from the band, sweet sounds from the lute and the harp, trumpets and trombones and horns. It's festival day, a feast to God, a day decreed by God, solemnly ordered by the God of Jacob. He commanded Joseph to keep this day so we'd never forget what he did in Egypt. What he did in our times. I hear this most gentle whisper from one I never guessed who would speak to me. Hear what he says. This is God speaking to his people. I took the world off your shoulders, freed you from life of hard labor. You called me in your pain, and I got you out of a bad place. I answered you from where the thunder hides. I provided you. I provided you at Meredith Fountain. Listen, listen, dear ones. Get this straight. O oh, Israel, O oh, ECBC, don't take this lightly. Don't take up the strange, strange gods. Don't worship the latest gods. I'm your God. Your God. The very God who rescued you from the doom in Egypt. The doom in your city. Then fed you all you could eat. Filled your hungry stomachs. But my people didn't listen. Israel paid no attention. God's people paid no attention. So let go of the rainies. Told them, run. Don't do it your way. Oh dear people, will you listen to me? Israel, ECBC, will you follow my map? I'll make short work of your enemies. Give your foes back to my hand, the back of my hand. I'll send the god haters cringing like dogs, never to be heard from again. Your feast, you'll feast on my fresh bread, spread with butter and pure rock honey. God wants us to come and encounter Him. When we come into worship, it is not just a place where we sit on hard benches. It's not a place where we just stand and we sing songs that make us feel good. It's not about coming and hearing a message that, that makes us feel like feel important or, or feel fulfilled. It's not about coming and hearing prayers that inspire us. When we come into this place to worship, it's to be a place where we come and encounter the one true living God. A place where our hearts are changed. A place where our we encounter God like we never encountered Him any other time during the week. A place where, where we get to lift our praise to God. He loved us enough to send His Son to die on a cross for my sins. Let's not let the world influence that. Let's not let the world tell us what our worship should be. Let's not let marketing tell us what it's all about. Now, those things might be a helpful tool. Those things might help us to, to, to show the gospel, to present the gospel to people. But that is not our priority as we enter into this place. Our priority as we come into worship is to worship God. To lift our voices to Him. When we ask and evaluate, when we evaluate our worship, when we think about what we're doing here, False worship would say, the dangerous false worship will say, I and me and us and they and whatever, all those pronouns. <coughs> True worship will say, Him. God. His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit. We come into this place. Sure.
our traditions, don't become the guide. Let's not be sure our personalities don't become our guide or our God. Let's make sure all that we do is based on His Word.